Hey everybody and welcome to episode 4 of Diversity of Life with me, Nasi. In celebration of me starting my PhD this month, I thought it would be good to dedicate the next couple episodes to what I'm studying, some general facts about the groups I'm studying, why I'm studying them, and what I'll be doing exactly. So for this episode, I thought I'd focus on the bees! Bees are actually a massive group of organisms with almost 20,000 member species worldwide to date. They are part of the larger superfamily, Apodia. This superfamily is part of the same order as ants and wasps. The diversity of this group is marked by quite a few life strategies. There are carpenter bees that nest in wood, leafcutter bees that roll up and nest in pieces of plant matter, bumblebees and honeybees that make the widely known honeycomb nests, and even the majority of the diversity within this group is solitary bees. They don't even have a colony. They just lay eggs in little holes in the ground and provide enough food for their larvae to survive. One of the key aspects of the diversity of this group is eusociality. Eusocial organisms are those that are defined as functioning as a group. They are characterized by brood care or looking after their babies, overlapping generations of adults, division of labor, often there's more than one cast or different kind of role within the nest, and often one of the casts lose a function or behavior that the other casts have. In the case of bees, you have a queen that is a sole reproductive productive as part of the colony. Then there are workers that tend to her and keep care of the brood and her offspring. And then you have drones that are the males and the ones that spread the genetic information to different populations. Eusociality in itself is quite an amazing adaptation and really deserves a video of its own. So maybe I'll do that in the future. Bees as a group are hypothesized to have arisen approximately 150 million years ago during the Cretaceous era. The diversification of this group coincides with the appearance of flowering plants about 100 to 100 25 million years ago. Flowering of plants was an adaptation that allowed plants to have a more efficient means of reproduction as the male and female genitalia are contained within a single area. They're able to house seeds more efficiently and often allows for a more efficient means of dispersing those seeds. As the pollen was housed in a single area, a lot of organisms benefited from this because pollen is a valuable protein source. And of course, bees benefited from this a great deal as pollen was their main source of protein. But in the case of the bees, it actually turned out that the bees and plants benefited, creating a mutualistic relationship. The pollen grains would stick to the hairs on the bees, and so when the bees traveled to a new plant to feed, they would disperse the pollen, thus spreading the genetic information of an individual plant farther than they could have done on their own. Ever since then, bees and plants have co-evolved very tightly, almost more than any other group of organisms on the planet. Enough so that modern bees have pollen pouches where they carry some pollen and actually have mechanisms to let loose some when they arrive to a new flower. And in the plant's case, some plants have evolved structures that will only release pollen when a certain vibration is felt. And this vibration happens to be the same frequency as some bees. This is the case in tomatoes. The structure that releases the pollen will only release that pollen when a bumblebee's vibrations are felt. So bumblebees are very important for the pollination of tomato plants. Often large scale growers of tomato will keep colonies of bumblebees just for that efficient means of pollinating their plants and getting tomatoes to grow. Bees are so important for pollination in general that it's estimated that about one in every three mouthfuls that you eat is a direct result of bee pollination. That's a lot of food. Pollination is one of the main reasons why entomologists study bees. It's just so important for our society. And it's one of the reasons why I'm studying them for my PhD. Some of you might have heard of a thing called colony collapse disorder. It is generally described as when the majority of workers from a colony of bees leaves the colony, leaving the queen and the brood to fend for themselves. This eventually results in the queen's death and the eventual collapse of the entire colony. Now, as you might imagine, for those that keep bees for honey, this is a huge economic loss, but it's also a threat to wild populations of bees, such as the carpenter bees and leafcutter bees and bumblebees that I mentioned earlier. And it's one of the main causes of the current bee crisis. And the worst part is we really don't know what causes the colony collapse disorder. We have been able to link a few things to it, anything from mites to pathogens to genetics, habitat loss, beekeeping practices, monoculturization of our crops, and pesticides. But no one definable thing has been found to be the cause of colony collapse disorder. The last thing that I mentioned, pesticides, is actually what I am going to be studying. There's a class of insecticides known as neonicotinoids that have been linked to behavior alterations in bees when they are exposed to sublethal dosages of those pesticides. And these behavioral alterations might contribute to colony collapse disorder. 
these kind of behavior alterations have been foraging alteration and foraging selection differences, changes in communication between individuals in a colony. And recently, this past year, a study by Trubowski and Sad out of Illinois State University found that when the bees were exposed to sublethal dosages of these pesticides, the bees' resistance to disease was significantly decreased. That means they're more likely to get sick when they're around these pesticides. Now, with so many negative impacts of these neonicotinoid pesticides, they have been banned in Europe and most of the US. But in Canada, it's still in wide use. There has some restrictions in Quebec and in the West Coast, but I'm hoping that research like my own will help to get this pesticide banned or restricted in use. That's only one small part of my research for my PhD. In the next episode, I'm going to delve into the group which is largely unexplored in regards to neonicotinoid pesticides, the ants. As always, I want to hear from you guys. What do you guys think about the bee crisis? Had you heard of it before watching this video? Did you guys like hearing about my research? Are you looking forward to hearing more in the next episode? Going forward, I have a few ideas that I think you guys might find interesting while I'm doing my research. I want to do things like streaming my lab and actually showing you guys my trials and experiments as they happen. Let me know what you think of that and if it's something that interests you. Thanks so much for watching guys. If you liked what you heard here, please hit the like button, the subscribe subscribe button and if you want to see more of my furry antics feel free to check out my twitter hope to see you guys next time see you later